This is a short video in relation to a post on one of my other videos for the LiPo 101 around the different elements of an electrical RC power system. So I thought I'd put together this uh, little video to go through a couple of slides and talk about the different elements. Uh, the elements we're going to talk about really break down into three main areas and what we're talking around here in this video is really the power systems that you typically find on an RC helicopter or an RC um, plane. If you into cars or uh, racing tr RC trucks, those kind of bits and pieces, the principles are the same, but you tend to find that the way they do the ratings is slightly different. But the principles are exactly the same, so you can uh, use the same information all the way through. The power system on an RC model breaks down into three main components. The first is the power, the second is the power conversion, and the third is the motor. Now on a model like this that we're um, looking at at the moment, which is a T-Rex 450 model. The battery sits on a battery tray at the, at the front, and for more information about LiPo batteries, please see my other video, LiPo Battery 101. The power conversion system, or the speed controller, in this model actually sits on this small tray below the battery, and it has a connector here to connect to the actual power itself. And the ESC's job we'll talk about in a while, but it takes the power from the battery and turns it into very high frequency pulses that go to the motor. And the motor in this model is here, and that's what's actually turning the rotors. Now that's something called a brushless motor, and again, we'll talk about that shortly. The first thing we'll talk about is the LiPo battery. This is a 20C 11.1 volt 3S LiPo pack that you tend to find on this 400 450 class helicopter. If you want to know more about the batteries in depth then please see my other video LiPo Battery 101 that goes into all the details. Essentially it is the power supply of the system. It's where all the electrical energy is stored from a charger ready to be released through the electronic speed controller into the motor. The two main numbers that you tend to find on a battery of this type are the C rating, and that's how quickly you can pull the power from the battery, and something called the milliamp hour rating, which is the capacity of the battery. And very quickly, the two difference between those two numbers is, if this was a tank of water, full of water, water representing the electrical power, the 20C would be how thick and how powerful the hose was that was connected to the bottom of the tank, how quickly you could get that water out, the higher the number, the more energy you can pull at any one time, and the 2100 milliamp hours is a analogous to how much water is in the tank. So the more milliamp hours, the more water is in the tank. They come in lots of shapes and sizes. Please see the other video for more detail on that. Um, the, uh, the only other thing to note is the S denotes the number of cells, and this actually has three cells inside that make the total battery that put the energy out of that plug into the speed controller. The next thing I'll talk about is the electronic speed controller, or ESC, you'll call them when you see them on forums. They essentially have three connectors. The first is a power connector, which connects the ESC to the battery, so it lets it pull the power from the pack. The second is three wires, which you can't really see here. They're coming out the back. There's a black, a um, blue, and a red one on this model, and they connect to the three phases inside the brushless motor and they provide the power. And the last one, there's another one, another cable, which you can just see here, which runs all the way to the back of the model to the receiver pack here. And that takes some of the power from the battery, converts it into five or six volts, depending on how you have it set up. And the receiver then powers all the different servos that move all the different control surfaces on the model. An ESC is, is pretty smart, actually, because it, um, it actually turns the DC voltage in here into very high frequency pulses of power that are applied to each of the phases of the motor in turn. The other thing an electronic speed controller does is it actually senses the position of the rotor within the motor, rotor motor, so that it can uh, fire up the next phase in turn to keep pulling the rotor around using electromagnetism. It means there's no brushes, so there's no electrical contacts connecting to any part of the motor inside, which makes it uh, very, very reliable 
um, but it does mean you're sent essentially a little electronic brain in this device here, this electronic speed controller, to figure out where the rotor is, what your throttle is, how much power's there, how much um, in advance of the rotor to, to fire up the next phase, all those bits and pieces. But that's all done for you in this little cute thing here. Now, sometimes you'll find that you'll buy an electronic speed controller and it won't have this additional lead on that's there to power the receiver and the servos. Now, that little bit of technology that's part of the electronic speed controller actually has its own name. It's called a battery eliminator circuit or BEC, or you'll sometimes heard them referred to as a UBEC, a universal battery eliminator circuit. Now, the reason that these were in uh, created was because back in the days where all the models were powered by gas or petrol then obviously you needed some uh, a power pack that would actually run the electronics inside the machine and they were run off A123 cells and other bits and pieces but as lipos and electronic power became more prevalent you needed a way to take the power from the battery drop it down to a safe level so that the receiver pack would work and the servos wouldn't burn out as well and this little bit of electronics isn't about running the motor, all it does is drops the power from the battery down to that safe level for the rest of the electronics in the device. Now, you can actually buy separate um, BECs. Now, this is one that I've set up, and I use it for setting up receiver packs. So it's actually got a connector that plugs into the battery, and this little thing will run, I don't know if you can see that on the screen very well, it's rated at 3 amps max, 5 amps, and it's a switch mode one, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. On the bottom, you can select either 6 or 5 volts output, depending on how you want to work it. And uh, this is a great little device, because if you're using a very high-power electronic speed controller, they don't tend to have these integrated as part of it. Or if you're worried about having problems with the onboard uh, BEC that's part of the electronic speed controller, you can put a separate one in with a higher rating. I would say if you're going to fly any large models, it's just uh, safe and sound to put a UBEC or a universal battery illuminator circuit in alongside the electronic speed controller. Let this take care of the electronics and let the ESC take care of the motor and running the, um, uh, the speed. There are two types of battery illuminator circuit. Uh, one is called linear and the other is switch mode. Um, the, the difference is linear is cheap as chips, uh, but it's relatively inefficient. The way it reduces the voltage from this big battery down to five or six volts that the rest of the system will like is essentially by dumping that excess power as heat. So they get very hot. This big heat sink here on this electronic speed controller, you can see it's like a blue washboard, is actually there to dissipate that additional heat. And a lot of the heat that you feel on a speed controller after a flight is actually coming from the heat that's generated by the onboard battery illuminator circuit. So if you don't use the battery illuminator circuit, you tend to find that your speed controller will run a lot cooler as well. The other type of uh, battery eliminator circuit is called a switch mode and this is using frequency and, and basically chopping the voltage up into little chunks um, so that it, it, it drops the voltage like that is a very basic way of explaining it but it means it's very efficient, it's a little bit smarter but they run a lot cooler and they're a lot more um, efficient in terms of the battery power that's used to run the bits and pieces. The last piece we'll talk about is the motor. The motor on this model is here and it runs this large cog which then runs the rotor system at the top of the model. An electronic speed controller is always used with a brushless motor. Back in the days when there used to be brushed motors, i.e. they had little carbon contacts that connected to the, um, the rotor uh, within the device, they would run out and the, the, the motor and the speed the motor turned was a direct result of how much energy and voltage you put in. So the, the voltage regulator was very simplistic, it was just like a variable resistor. With a brushless motor like this you need an electronic speed controller to do that job we talked about before where it's delivering lots of high frequency pulses to the phases inside the motor one after the other to pull that motor around and make it turn. The last part of the power system is the one that does the work is the motor. So you have the battery connected to the ESC and the ESC runs the motor. 
And again, the ESC is doing two things, not only providing the power and chopping up that voltage into a number of high frequency pulses that drive the motor itself, but it's also quite cleverly sensing where the motor is to make sure that it's firing the right phase in the right order. One thing to be aware of on this is if you ever put a model together and you find that the motor is running in the wrong direction, then you, very simply you can swap any two of the three wires that connect the ESC to the motor and you'll find it will run the other way. You don't have to worry about polarity or braking anything, it's just the way it tends to work. On some uh, speed controllers you can actually set the, um, the, the forward or reverse in software but most model makers I know just tend to, when they're testing everything and they're running up the motor, if it runs backwards they just swap two of the wires across, it's quite simple. The motor has two numbers that you think about. One is amps, which is the or watts, which is the amount of power this um, motor will pull when it's running, and you need to know that to know the rating of the speed controller and the battery, and we'll come on to that next. And the second one is the KVA rating, which is how fast the motor is going to turn. So the shorthand way of thinking about it is the watts or amps. The higher the number, the more grunt or power this thing has so the, the, the larger loads it will be able to cope with and the larger the KVA number the faster this motor will turn for a given inputted voltage. So you could have a motor that has a very high amp rating but a very low KVA rating which means you know it'll pull a normal sized car but it'll only turn two times every minute or you might have the other way around which is you have a very low amp rating and a very high KVA rating which means it'll spin like crazy but you'll be able to stop it by putting your finger on the end of the shaft. The last thing we'll talk about is how you size the parts of an electrical system. Now I've always used the 10% rule and it's kept me nice and safe. If for example you had a motor that had a 30 amp maximum current draw then I would always look to make sure that I had at least 10% headroom in the electronic speed controller. And that means if there was any stalling or um, any undue expected load from a bearing problem or whatever it was, that the electronic speed controller could cope with that and manage it very easily. So I would say for a 30 amp motor, I'd be looking for a 33, 35 amp speed controller. And to be honest, it'd probably end up being a 35 amp speed controller, which is actually what this one is here in this model. The next thing you need to do is figure out about how many amps you need to have the battery being able to supply without having a problem. And again, it's a 10% rule. So if this is a 33 or 35 amp electronic speed controller, I'd want 10% headroom on that, so I'd be looking for a 38 or 40 amp battery. Now, this is a 2100 amp milliamp hour battery at 20C, so this can comfortably supply 42 amps. So, this will supply 42 amps, this will supply 35 amps, this will pull 30 amps. So it means that I have headroom in the system. So if there's a manufacturing tolerance issue, um, I'm not running any of these individual components at their absolutely maximum rating. That'll do two things. One, it gives me that margin of safety. So if I have a problem, um, the system can cope with it. And secondly, it also means that I'm being kinder to these um, elements and they're not under the same amount of electrical stress. If this guy's rated for 35 amps and I'm only pulling 30, it's going to last longer and give me better performance than one that I'm pushing all the time that's getting very, very hot and the insides are starting to um, suffer from thermal stress. The last thing we'll talk about is how you size a UBEC or a battery eliminator circuit. The key to this is uh, making sure that the battery eliminator circuit has more than enough power to handle everything. And the trick is, have a look at all of your servos, look at their maximum amp ratings, um, add in an extra little bit for the receiver, and then add an extra chunk just to make sure that you're safe. Um, most of the electronic systems these days are a lot better. In the early days of 2.4 gigahertz transmitters, there was the occasionally a brown out, and what that meant was the voltage would drop slightly because the, maybe the all of the control services were under a lot of stress, the servos were pulling a lot of power, and the voltage would drop slightly, and the receiver would reset in mid-flight. Now, that was always exciting. 
So the trick is, if you have a BEC that's rated, that gives you lots of headroom, if you do have a stalled uh, control service, an aileron, an elevator, a rudder, or the model's having to work really hard because you, you're pulling a particularly difficult manoeuvre where you're, you're almost got the head on full lock in a helicopter, the control system will handle it fine, your receiver will stay connected and everything will continue to work. Thanks for watching, I hope that made sense. If you have any questions please post them and uh, any comments for other videos I'm always interested to hear. Thanks for watching, bye for now.